Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring UFOs Flight 18 by Paul A. Torak An Incident on Route 12 by James H. Schmitz Classified Object by John Victor Peterson The Deadly Ones by F. L. Wallace Master Race by Richard Ashby Flight 18 by Paul A. Torak Originally published in Thrilling Wonder Stories, August 1953 Narrated by Tom Trisser Mr. Bradbury was angry. Fog or no fog, the airlines should stay on schedule. Lack of planning, foresight, sense of responsibility, that was a trouble. He felt like cursing. Damn, said Mr. Bradbury. But a voice on the public address system announced that Flight 18 for Chicago was ready to leave. He raised his considerable bunk from the chair in the dimly lit waiting room of the airfield and checked his watch. No way to run a business. He shook his head and snorted indignantly. Such a snort is worthy of note. It was an utterance that could be made only by a corporation lawyer in the prime of life. It was a nasal explosion connoting wealth, confidence and a singular lack of imagination. It was a snort fed on T-bone steaks, good scotch whisky, and bicarbonate of soda. Mr. Bradbury peered myopically around the waiting room. A few minutes ago, while washing his face in the men's room, he had broken his glasses in the washbowl. Although he hated to admit it to anyone, he could see next to nothing without those thick lenses. The room was an unpleasant blur, but he was able to determine that he was the only would-be passenger in the waiting room. The others were drinking coffee in the airfield's restaurant. Flight 18, said the voice on the speaker. Flight 18. Mr. Bradbury shrugged his heavy shoulders, picked up his bag and briefcase, and stepped out the door into the fog. The mist hung thick and low over the airfield, cloaking the damp night air in a morbid blanket of gloom. Mr. Bradbury blinked suddenly into the shroud-like vapour. What the hell, he swore. Can't even see the plane, and he thought, floundering unhappily into a wire gate wherein blazes are the rest of the passengers. Are they going to fly through this stuff? This way, sir, said a feminine voice, and he saw a dim, uniformed figure in front of him. The hostess. Glad someone knows where he's going, he thought, and then he followed the girl toward the now visible lights of the plane. Watch your step, sir she said as he walked up the runway. He grunted, making these things steeper all the time, he thought. The hostess was a pretty, dark-eyed young thing, plump in the right sort of way. Mr. Bradbury leaned back in the soft, cushioned seat. It felt good. Fasten your safety belt, sir, she helped him with it. And I do hope you'll be comfortable, she said in a soft, low voice. He caught the glint of black eyes, jet and sparkling. He smiled at her, appreciatively. I'm sure I will, he grinned, resisting a sudden impulse to pinch her cheek. The girl walked down the aisle toward the door again, hips swaying provocatively. A young blossom ready for the plucking, thought Mr. Bradbury. A succulent young partridge ready for the... Mr. Bradbury chuckled to himself happily on thinking of the many women he had known in his fifty years. He looked around the plane. No passengers except for a pleasant-looking young man sitting across the aisle from him, a young man thoroughly engrossed in a small paper-bound book, the title of which Mr. Bradbury could not discern. He wished he had his glasses, for he was getting a slight headache. The lawyer leaned back in the soft seat and closed his eyes. Well, headache or no headache, life was good, and he was glad he was alive. Then Mr. Bradbury fell asleep. When he awoke, the plane was in flight, and looking out the window he could see nothing but darkness broken only by an occasional cloud formation. 
The man across the aisle was staring into the blackness outside, the book he had been reading discarded and left lying on the floor. Mr. Bradbury stretched himself and looked around him. The plane had been darkened and apparently only he and the young man were awake. He yawned. A great conversationalist, Mr. Bradbury craved discourse. But where was the opening wedge necessary to break the bond of silence between him and the other passenger? Then his eyes fell on the book lying on the floor. He picked it up and held it close so that he could see. The title had something to do with flying saucers, and the cover illustration, a lurid affair, showed a green-skinned, globe-headed, tentacled creature equipped with a tiny rocket motor on its back, an expression of what was supposed to pass for lust in his face. The thing was carrying away a beautiful, thinly clad earth girl, her face contorted with fear. In the background hung a disc-shaped spaceship hovering over a burning earth city. Rubbish, said Mr. Gradbury in a loud voice so that the young man across the aisle would hear him. I beg your pardon, asked the other passenger, turning away from the window, eyebrows raised in question. The book you're reading, answered the corporation lawyer. Rubbish! The smooth-faced young man blushed and smiled apologetically. Well, I suppose you're right, but it's sort of fun, you know, reading this sort of thing. The lawyer chuckled condescendingly and shook his head. He turned the book over in his hands almost fondly. He wished he had his glasses so that he could read it. It's sort of refreshing, if you know what I mean, continued the man as if feeling some further defence of his choice in literature were necessary. Rubbish, chuckled Mr. Bradbury for the third time. A shadow of annoyance registered on the young man's face. The lawyer put down the book and extended his hand across the aisle. Bradbury is the name, he said. Represent the Hotchkiss Oil Industries. Oil is my business, he added impressively. The young man hesitated for a moment, then accepted Mr. Bradbury's hand. The lawyer reflected momentarily that for a frail-looking young fellow the chap showed an amazing strength in his handshake. Tarkas is my name, said Mr. Bradbury's new acquaintance, Oswald Tarkas. In business, Mr. Tarkas? Well, no, laughed Mr. Tarkas nervously. Not exactly. I suppose you might say that I just sort of putter around. I work for a museum. Mr. Bradbury frowned. He had never known anyone who just sort of puttered around in museums. He wasn't quite sure that he approved. Such an occupation seemed vaguely un-American, subversive, although he couldn't quite say why. A museum? What museum? Oswald Tarkas hesitated, looked at the floor, and then answered almost timidly, as if he expected some reprimand. Well, it's probably not too well known. The Canal City Museum. Hmm, muttered the lawyer. No, can't say that I've heard of it. Where is it? New York? San Francisco? Oswald Tarkas had turned away for a moment and was staring out the window. The motors of the plane hummed pleasantly, giving a sense of comforting power. The plane's cabin was dark, except for the lights over in Mr. Tarkas and Mr. Bradbury's seats. Oh no, replied Mr. Tarkas. We do have our branches in those cities, but it's a bit difficult to pin us down. We're more or less a research outfit. A sort of an international organisation, if you know what I mean. Mr. Bradbury didn't, but he nodded his head agreeably. "'And what do you do for the museum, Tarkas?' he asked. "'Well, I'm what you might call a collector. Of sorts,' he added. "'Yes, I sort of collect things in a way, you might say.' The lawyer, a great student of human character, noted that his new acquaintance wore a crew-cut, his face was thin and looked clean-cut except for a slight weakness about the chin. "'Well now, Oswald,' he said, "'you don't mind my calling you Oswald, do you? I like to be friendly.' "'Not at all,' flushed Mr. Tarkas happily. "'I like to be friendly too, when my work permits,' he added. "'I have a lot of respect for museums,' ventured Mr. Bradbury. He had never been in a museum." Cultural institutions, that sort of thing. He went on waving his hand. 
My company often makes contributions to worthy institutions. Maybe I can do something for your outfit. Oswald Tarkas seemed appreciative. Now that's awfully kind, and, you know, we accept all contributions gratefully. We take what we can get. There was an embarrassed pause in the conversation. Then Mr. Bradbury remembered the book he held in his hand. This book, he said, holding it up in his hand. Nonsense! He scoffed, shaking his head. Know what the flying saucers really were? Well, started Oswald. Balloons! Balloons? Weather balloons, assured Mr. Bradbury emphatically. Weather balloons! That's all they were. Oswald looked as if he were about to say something, but didn't. Mr. Bradbury, obviously enjoying himself, drew two expensive cigars from his coat pocket. Have one, he offered. Oswald hesitated and then accepted. He put the cigar in his breast pocket. But, stammered Oswald, what about the witnesses, the National Guard pilot, the airliner pilots, the Army anti-aircraft observers? The lawyer drew in the rich tobacco fumes and tilted his large, handsome head. Hallucinations, he said. Mass hysteria. A smile of amused indulgence lit his large, florid face. Oh, oh, what a world of fantastic notions was begun by that first atomic explosion. Now, for example, the notion that these so-called flying saucers are extraterrestrial. Mr. Bradbury waved the very idea away with a gesture of dismissal. If there are intelligent beings from another planet in control of these hypothetical spaceships, why haven't they contacted us by this time? Well, suggested Mr. Tarkas thoughtfully, maybe they have their reasons. Maybe you can't judge the actions of extraterrestrial beings by terrestrial standards of conduct. And the meteors, continued Mr. Bradbury, ignoring Oswald's last remark, the meteors make space travel impossible. Do you realise that every day our atmosphere is burning up thousands of those meteors? Do you know that just one of those meteors, the size of a pea, could smash right through the thickest armoured plate and wreck any rocket? Something small and glowing smashed into the outside of Mr. Bradbury's window and ricocheted off into space. What was that? asked Mr. Bradbury, half rising from his seat. I don't know, answered Oswald, and then he added jokingly, Maybe it was a meteor. The lawyer stared out the window, but still he could see nothing but blackness. He settled back into his seat again, shrugging his shoulders. Well now, he resumed, as I said, the meteors can't escape them. But, suggested Mr. Tarkas defensively, couldn't the rocket sort of scoot around them? He simpered as if embarrassed by such a ridiculous notion, and made a half-hearted gesture with his right hand that Mr. Bradbury assumed was a scooting motion. Mr. Bradbury dismissed this contention with a wave of his cigar. Just then the airliner gave a sickening lurch to the right, and something big and luminous roared past the plane. Mr. Bradbury bellowed, "'Roughest damn trip I've ever had!' "'It makes me nervous too,' said Oswald." "'Now another thing,' said the lawyer. "'This business about men from Mars.' He looked uneasily out his window. Oswald smiled. "'No truth in it?' "'None. Anyone with even a token knowledge of science knows that the Earth is the only place that can support human life.' "'But,' answered Oswald, "'suppose that planets could be inhabited by something other than human life, like that thing on the cover there?' He motioned toward the book Mr. Bradbury held. Mr. Bradbury laughed, about to explode this fallacy with another barrage of devastating logic. He was interrupted. "'Say, Brad, you don't mind my calling you Brad, do you?' "'Of course not,' smiled the lawyer affably. "'You say there's no such thing as flying saucers?' Mr. Bradbury inhaled from his cigar and shook his head. "'Hallucinations,' he said positively. "'You're sure of that? Stake my life on it!' Well, I'm sure glad of that, because for a long time now the dampness hallucination I've ever seen has been flying alongside of us. Mr. Bradbury rose from his seat, stepped across the aisle, and looked out Mr. Tarkas's window. He squinted out into the darkness. It was there all right, no wings, disc-shaped, rows of lighted windows, 
luminous vapour emanating from the rear. "'Damn!' exclaimed Mr. Bradbury, and pressed the button for the stewardess. She came quickly down the darkened aisle. "'Flight 18,' she said blankly. "'Flight 18.' Mr. Bradbury stared. "'Did you ring, sir?' she asked. "'Good Lord, yes,' said the lawyer. "'Look!' he pointed to the window. The stewardess, plump and pretty as ever, didn't look, but with amazing strength pushed him down into his seat. "'This way, sir,' she said, smiling pleasantly. "'What's going on?' roared Mr. Bradbury, starting to rise again from his seat. "'Watch your step, sir,' answered the stewardess, giving him another shove. "'Fasten your safety belt, sir,' she said, and before the lawyer could protest again, he found himself fastened down in his seat. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she said in a soft, low voice. He caught the glint of black eyes, jet and sparkling. She turned, took one step up the aisle, and stopped. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she repeated. She stood there motionless, as if paralysed in the middle of the aisle. "'And I do hope you'll be comfortable, sir,' she said again. "'And I do hope you'll be—' Mr. Tarkus stifled a yawn, rose from his seat, and stepped over to the girl. He reached out and twisted her ear. Her voice stopped, and her back slid open like a secret panel, revealing a maze of whirring, clicking machinery. "'What? What?' stuttered Mr. Bradbury. "'She's a—' "'A robot,' smiled Oswald Tarkus happily. He turned from his examination of the defective machinery. "'She's not a very good robot. Her vocal mechanism jams now and then, but she serves the purpose. You'll be surprised how many of you we catch this way.' Then Oswald touched a wall switch. The darkened plane blazed into light. There were no passengers on the plane other than Oswald, Mr. Bradbury, and the robot stewardess that stood silently in the aisle. Mr. Bradbury could still see the flying disc outside the window. Oswald saw the direction of his glance. "'Friend of mine,' he grinned. The lawyer looked wildly around the empty plane. "'Where? Where are the passengers?' he croaked, a numbing suspicion growing in his mind. "'No other passengers,' answered Oswald, standing there, still smiling. "'You just got in the wrong boat, Brad, old fellow.' The cabin of the airliner was changing. It was beginning to look like something very unlike an airliner cabin. The seats dissolved into walls which seemed to expand in the shape of a circular room. The large disc-shaped compartment lined with machinery, tanks and dials, glass cages of sleeping terrestrial animals. One large cage was empty. Mr. Bradbury stared at this unoccupied glass cylinder. "'Yes,' grinned Oswald, "'for you! "'But don't worry, just pass it all off as a hallucination. "'Want to see where we are, sport?' "'A panel opened in the floor, "'and Mr. Bradbury looked out into the black void of outer space, "'and there, in the centre of that panel of darkness, "'was the planet Earth, "'a tiny silver ball rapidly diminishing in size. "'What are you?' screamed Mr. Bradbury, struggling against the belt that held him in his seat. "'What are you?' "'A collector,' said Oswald Tarkas, tearing off his head and revealing underneath the disguise a small globe of bone and flesh, two glowing eyes, a mouth filled with many white, sharp teeth. "'A collector,' it repeated as the false arms and legs and torso were ripped away, revealing a shapeless green body equipped with spindly tentacles that waved obscenely at Mr. Bradbury. Of sorts, it added as it moved toward the frightened lawyer. Mr. Bradbury screamed. Rubbish, it giggled. Weather balloons, hallucinations, it chirped gaily, and writhing snake-like appendages reached out for the twisting, screaming, hysterical figure of Mr. Bradbury and through the empty reaches of the cosmos two tiny disks hurtled towards Sol's fourth planet. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. An Incident on Route 12 by James H. Schmitz Originally published in Worlds of If
January 1962 Narrated by Tom Trisson Phil Garfield was 30 miles south of the little town of Redmond on Route 12 when he was startled by a series of sharp clanking noises. They came from under the Packard's hood. The car immediately began to lose speed. Garfield jammed down the accelerator, had a sense of sick helplessness at the complete lack of response from the motor. The Packard moved on, letting rid of its momentum, and came to a stop. Phil Garfield swore shakily. He checked his watch, switched off the headlights, and climbed out into the dark road. A delay of even half an hour here might be disastrous. It was past midnight, and he had another hundred and ten miles to cover to reach the small private airfield where Madge waited for him and the thirty thousand dollars in the suitcase on the Packard's front seat. If he didn't make it before daylight... He thought of the bank guard. The man had made a clumsy play at being a hero, and that had set off the fool woman who'd run screaming into their line of fire. One dead, perhaps two. Garfield hadn't stopped to look at an evening paper. But he knew they were hunting for him. He glanced up and down the road. No other headlights in sight at the moment, no light from a building showing on the forested hills. He reached back into the car and brought out the suitcase, his gun, a big flashlight, and the box of shells which had been standing beside the suitcase. He broke the box open, shoved a handful of shells and the thirty-eight into his cloak pocket, then took suitcase and flashlight over to the shoulder of the road and set them down. There was no point in groping about under the Packard's hood. When it came to mechanics, Phil Garfield was a moron, and well aware of it. The car was useless to him now, except as bait. But as bait it might be very useful. Should he leave it standing where it was? No, Garfield decided. To anybody driving past it would merely suggest a necking party, or a drunk sleeping off his load before continuing home. He might have to wait an hour or more before someone decided to stop. He didn't have the time. He reached in through the window, hauled the top of the steering wheel towards him, and put his weight against the rear window frame. The Packard began to move slowly backwards at a slant across the road. In a minute or two he had it in position. Not blocking the road entirely, which would arouse immediate suspicion, but angled across it, lights out, empty, both front doors open, and inviting a passerby's investigation. Garfield carried the suitcase and flashlight across the right-hand shoulder of the road and moved up among the trees and undergrowth of the slope above the shoulder. Placing the suitcase between the bushes, he brought out the thirty-eight, clicked the safety off, and stood waiting. Some ten minutes later, a set of headlights appeared speeding up Route 12 from the direction of Redmond. Phil Garfield went down on one knee before he came within range of the lights. Now he was completely concealed by the vegetation. The car slowed as it approached, breaking nearly to a stop sixty feet from the stalled Packard. There were several people inside it. Garfield heard voices, then a woman's loud laugh. The driver tapped his horn inquiringly twice, moved the car slowly forward. As the headlights went past him, Garfield got to his feet among the bushes, took a step down towards the road, raising the gun. Then he caught the distant gleam of a second set of headlights approaching from Redmond. He swore under his breath and dropped back out of sight. The car below him reached the Packard, edged cautiously around it, rolled on with a sudden roar of acceleration. The second car stopped when still a hundred yards away, the Packard caught in the motionless glare of its lights. Garfield heard the steady purring of a powerful motor. For almost a minute nothing else happened, then the car came gliding smoothly on, 
stopped again no more than thirty feet to Garfield's left. He could see it now through the screening bushes, a big job, a long, low four-door sedan. The motor continued to purr. After a moment, a door on the far side of the car opened and slammed shut. A man walked quickly out into the beam of the headlights and started toward the Packard. Phil Garfield rose from his crouching position, the thirty-eight in his right hand, flashlight in his left. If the driver was alone, the thing was now cinched. But if there was somebody else in the car, somebody capable of fast, decisive action, a slip in the next ten seconds might cost him the sedan and quite probably his freedom and life. Garfield lined up the thirty-eight sights steadily on the centre of the approaching man's head. He let his breath out slowly as the fellow came level with him in the road and squeezed off one shot. Instantly he went bounding down the slope to the road. The bullet had flung the man sideways to the pavement. Garfield darted past him to the left, crossed the beam of the headlights, and was in darkness again on the far side of the road, snapping on his flashlight as he sprinted up to the car. The motor hummed quietly on. The flashlight showed the seats empty. Garfield dropped the light, jerked both doors open in turn, gun pointing into the car's interior. Then he stood still for a moment, weak and almost dizzy with relief. There was no one inside. The sedan was his. The man he had shot through the head lay face down on the road, his hat flung a dozen feet away from him. Route 12 still stretched out in dark silence to east and west. There should be time enough to clean up the job before anyone else came along. Garfield brought the suitcase down and put it on the front seat of the sedan, then started back to get his victim off the road and out of sight. He scaled the man's hat into the bushes, bent down, grasped the ankles, and started to haul him towards the left side of the road where the ground dropped off sharply beyond the shoulder. The body made a high squealing sound and began to writhe violently. Shocked, Garfield dropped the legs and hurriedly took the gun from his pocket, moving back a step. The squealing noise rose in intensity as the wounded man quickly flopped over twice like a struggling fish, arms and legs sawing about with startling energy. Garfield clicked off the safety, pumped three shots into his victim's back. The grisly squeals ended abruptly. The body continued to jerk for another second or two, then lay still. Garfield shoved the gun back into his pocket. The unexpected interruption had unnerved him. His hands shook as he reached down again for the stranger's ankles. Then he jerked his hands back and straightened up, staring. From the side of the man's chest, a few inches below the right arm, something like a thick black stick, three feet long, protruded now through the material of the coat. It shone, gleaming wetly, in the light from the car. Even in that first uncomprehending instant, something in its appearance brought a surge of sick disgust to Garthfield's throat. Then the stick bent slowly halfway down its length, forming a sharp angle, and its tip opened into what could have been three blunt black claws which scrubbled clumsily against the pavement. Very faintly, the squealing began again, and the body's back arched up as if another stick-like arm were pushing desperately against the ground beneath it. Garfield acted in a blur of horror. He emptied the thirty-eight into the thing at his feet almost without realising he was doing it. Then, dropping the gun, he seized one of the ankles, ran backwards into the shoulder of the road, dragging the body behind him. In the darkness at the edge of the shoulder, he let go of it, stepped around to the other side, and with two frantically savage kicks sent the body plunging over the shoulder and down the steep slope beyond. He heard it crash through the bushes for some seconds, then stop. He turned and ran back to the sedan, scooping up his gun as he went past. He scrambled into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut behind him. His hands shook violently on the steering wheel as he pressed down the accelerator. 
The motor roared into life, and the big car surged forward. He edged it past the Packard, cursing aloud in horrified shock, jammed down the accelerator, and went flashing up Route 12, darkness racing beside and behind him. What had it been? Something that wore what seemed to be a man's body like a suit of clothes, moving the body as a man moves, driving a man's car, roach-armed, roach-legged itself. Garfield drew a long, shuddering breath. Then, as he slowed for a curve, there was a spark of reddish light in the rear-view mirror. He stared at the spark for an instant, braked the car to a stop, rolled down the window, and looked back. Far behind him along Route 12, a fire burned, approximately at the point where the Packard had stalled out, where something had gone rolling off the road into the bushes. Something, Garfield added mentally, that found fiery automatic destruction when death came to it, so that its secrets would remain unrevealed. But for him, the fire meant the end of a nightmare. He rolled the window up, took out a cigarette, lit it, and pressed the accelerator. In incredulous fright, he felt the nose of the car tilt upwards, headlights sweeping up from the road into the trees. Then the headlights winked out. Beyond the windshield, dark tree branches floated down toward him, the night sky beyond. He reached frantically for the door handle. A steel wrench clamped silently about each of his arms, drawing them in against his sides, immobilizing them there. Garfield gasped, looked up at the mirror, and saw a pair of faintly gleaming red eyes watching him from the rear of the car. Two of the things. The second one stood behind him out of sight, holding him. They'd been in what had seemed to be the trunk compartment, and they had come out. The eyes in the mirror vanished. A moist black roach arm reached over the back of the seat beside Garfield, picked up the cigarette he had dropped, extinguished it with a rather horribly human motions, then took up Garfield's gun and drew back out of sight. He expected a shot, but none came. One doesn't fire a bullet through the suit one intends to wear. It wasn't until that thought occurred to him that tough Phil Garfield began to scream. He was still screaming minutes later when, Beyond the windshield, the spaceship floated into view among the stars. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Classified Object by John Victor Peterson Originally published in Fantastic Universe, July 1954. Narrated by Tom Trissel. This, for the greater part, George Winthrop learned later. The harried controller observing the airport surveillance radar scope in the La Guardia Airport control tower that sultry night at first ignored the uncommonly bright blip creeping in from the scope's periphery. Blips, thirty miles out, are of little significance. There are too many other airports within the radius with their own traffic problems. This return was coming from northwest of Teterboro, New Jersey. Let Teterboro Tower worry about it. The weather was worsening, and the Air Route Traffic Control Center already had traffic stacked up and holding traffic he could not ignore. But his tired eyes were repeatedly drawn to the fantastically registering blip as it traced some object's beeline path in from the northwest, progressively advancing across electronic range marks and maintaining a constant course toward the airport, as charted by the indicator's reference bearing mark. Over New Hackensack now, moving across the scope's overlay map toward the George Washington Bridge. The return's strength easily equaled that from a dirigible and far exceeded that from a commercial ship. 
The blip was too bright, the trail behind it too long, too remarkably persistent. Possibly the Air Force had some super globemaster that might account for the blip, but in that case a flight plan would have been filed on so huge a craft's trip into the metropolitan area. It was damnably puzzling. There was something inexorable about the steady, precise progress of the object which brought mounting unaccountable alarm. He raised his head, his thin, tense face doubly shadowed by the amber light over the scope's filter and the radar tent's ultraviolet lighting. "'Hey, Bill!' he shouted. "'I've either picked up something strictly unclassified or gone cockeyed!' The chief controller crowded into the radar tent beside him. "'Where? Oh! Oh! I'm calling Mitchell Field. This is for the Air Force!' One. It was warm that night, with a breathless, enervating warmth before a summer storm. Too warm, certainly, to sit below in an apartment in idle discussion, knowing that his brother and sister-in-law would have resented missing the TV shows which a modest purse made their sole entertainment. Earlier, George Winthrop had excused himself and gone to the apartment building's roof to watch the steady procession of planes coming in under the murky, threatening overcast over Jackson Heights, planes which swept spectacularly low over Grand Central Parkway to the runway, their throttled engines coughing loudly in the closeness of the night. He leaned against the concrete and brick parapet, looking disinterestedly at the round red eyes of the airport's approach light lane, staring unblinkingly at the threatening sky toward Brooklyn. He was chokingly filled with thoughts of yesterday's work and of his planned tomorrow, impatient with the enforced vacation of today. His eyes wandered blindly toward the northern sky and cleared suddenly, focusing. Coming in over the airport at less than 400 feet altitude was an unilluminated cylinder, pointed at the nose, bulbous at the stern. It was descending almost imperceptibly, moving with unbelievable slowness for its apparent size and lack of airfoils. He knew at once that he beheld something the like of which no nation on earth had presumed to make, except as a mock-up on a picture lot. Spaceship, his mind registered. With mounting excitement, he saw the object slowly crossing through the beam of the ceiling light pointing up from the airport's administration building. It moved without visible means of propulsion. Was it moving silently? He couldn't be sure, for several planes were noisily warming for takeoff between it and his vantage point. He'd watched aircraft, V-2s, and various missiles too long to miss the significance of the object's glide angle. Unless it lifted under power, it would surely descend in the flushing area. He turned, raced across the roof, and descended quickly to the street, his heart beating like a bass drum. Ten minutes later, as he swung his car toward Grand Central Parkway, he felt time's urgency, the beating pulse that had measured out minutes that so often could have been the last minutes, when he'd perched upon high towers, removing the connecting plugs of fission bombs that had failed to detonate. Oh, God, not this stomach-wrenching nervousness again! His eyes flicked momentarily to the dashboard's vacant panel which had held the clock he'd smashed that day when time's pressure had grown too great. Forget it! he told himself almost frantically. You're over that. You're well again. He sped past the airport, curved under the bridge where Northern Boulevard's eastbound lane crosses the parkway, and found the heavy late evening traffic out of Manhattan stalled, blocking all three lanes ahead. It must have landed in Flushing Meadow Park. On impulse, he swung right and up around to Northern Boulevard, crossing over the parkway. He cut left through a half-moon turnaround, the wrong way, and swung deftly through the westbound traffic into the boat basin, and then back under the boulevard on the undulating road through the park. Passing under the towering elevated structure and the railroad overpass, 
he discovered with a strange mixture of exultation and apprehension that his deduction had been correct. The cylinder lay in smothering folds of darkness on the gently rising slope near the City of New York building. He stopped, leaving the car's motor running, its headlights on high beam. Quickly he took a Geiger counter from the glove compartment and, dismounting, approached the object. The counter failed to respond. There was not even heat radiation. To his cautious touch, the stern was neither warmer nor cooler than the night. He gazed fascinatedly at the object's expanse. Two hundred feet long, he guessed, increasing from its pointed bow to about a thirty-foot diameter at its midpoint. The diameter was constant back to a point thirty feet forward of the stern, then became abruptly bulbous. It resembled a monstrous gourd, bearing what strange seeds. Undoubtedly this silent, implacable thing came from far beyond man's ken, a misshapen nautilus fitted out to probe the void. Had it come deliberately, or had it blundered, a derelict, to earth? The sultry night suddenly filled with sound. Awed and frightened motorists broke through the fence from Grand Central Parkway and streamed across the park until a voice cried out authoritatively, Keep back! This is the army! This is a restricted area! Other figures raced from within the park. Anti-aircraft crews, Winthrop thought. The man who had shouted the orders was coming toward him. What are you doing here? It isn't just idle curiosity, Lieutenant, Winthrop said quickly. I'm a physicist. Los Alamos and other places. I'm afraid I'm damnably curious when something unclassified drops into our ordered world. I see. All right, stick around. Maybe you can help us classify it. The lieutenant smiled and swung away. Winthrop stood there alone as the soldiers got rid of the other civilians and established guard posts, then as prime movers urgently and noisily brought up ACAC guns, searchlights and engine generators. There was a bawling of commands, a tense, noisy excitement. Under the encircling searchlights' glare, Guards walked short posts, submachine guns ready. The noise subsided. Everything was in readiness, and, Winthrop thought, God grant that everything would be enough. Suddenly lightning forked across the sky. With a crashing thunder came a teeming rain which drove Winthrop hastily back to his car. The radiator coolant was boiling murmurously amid the rain's driving tumult. Winthrop shut off the lights and engine, sat staring through the streaming windshield at the smooth, enigmatic surface of the cylinder on the slope. There was a sleep-provoking magic in the downpour's prolonged pattern. O oh, ship of space, the rains of earth will wash your surface clean. 2. He awoke at dawn, stiff from the unnatural position of his sleep, momentarily confused as to his whereabouts. Then he caught sight of the cylinder, and memory came sweeping back. Had something come out of it? Descending from the car, he approached a group of men standing near the object. A short, heavy-set Major General who appeared to be in command turned sharp, suspicious eyes toward him. "'What are you doing here?' Winthrop introduced himself. The General's suspicion vanished and he clasped the younger man's hand warmly. "'I'm Bert Hill, Winthrop. I heard of your work from Benton Allen. He's a close personal friend.' "'Of mine, too,' Winthrop nodded. "'Haven't seen him since Nevada.' "'He's flying up from Los Alamos,' Hill said. "'Many of your colleagues are coming, everyone who might conceivably be useful.' "'Any sign of life?' Winthrop asked, gesturing toward the cylinder. "'No.' There's a port amidships, and some small apertures forward, but it might as well be a coffin. Why don't you look it over? But perhaps you'd like to get comfortable and have breakfast first. We've set up a temporary mess kitchen in the city building. Thanks, General Hill. Call me Bert. 
When George Winthrop returned, he found that a sizable group of tired-looking civilians had joined the military. Most of them were men with whom he had been associated. Greetings were brief, detailed personal reminiscences sternly contraindicated. They examined the cylinder. With a great deal of effort, an engineer succeeded in unfastening the port lugs. Signal corps movie cameras whirred as the port opened, but nothing emerged. Carry on, George, General Hill said. You've priority. And we better wait, the others protested. Who knows what an alien might consider trespass? We've got to risk it, the general said. Perhaps they need our help. Perhaps they're ill or injured. Hill and Winthrop peered into the interior. Vacuum tubes shone dully through an indistinct maze of ductwork, circuitry, relay banks, and directly before them, facing the port. It's a fission bomb! Bert's nervousness was suddenly wild within Winthrop. He thought it. Amazingly like ours! He grasped the port tightly, fighting trembling unease with taut muscles. I must look at it more closely, he went on. It may not be fully armed, but I'd better disarm the detonating device if I can. If it's anything like ours, it wouldn't take much tinkering to set it off. There's probably enough explosive in the detonator alone to ruin the interior completely. We could be trapped inside and blown apart. He paused, then added courageously. I'll need light to get the plugs out quickly. That looks like a button switch, the general volunteered, reaching into the port. Winthrop slapped his hand away. Don't be a fool. The slightest touch might detonate it. Guess you're right, the general conceded, turning away. Montemir, run an extension over here. Winthrop crawled into the ship, arose, and stared in bitter indecision. He remembered a blockhouse at Bikini, another at Frenchman's Flat, voices harsh on loudspeakers counting the seconds away to zero. He remembered armed bombs on ghastly towering frameworks of steel vibrating beneath his touch with the furious kiss of atomic death awaiting the slightest slipping of his fingers. Get on with it! He did. The plugs were out. He was faint, drenched with perspiration. The general was peering intently through the port. It's okay now, Bert. Cautiously, the general entered, then turned back with an abrupt gesture. Montemur, he cried to the signal corp major. The equipment in here is still energized. Take shots of everything. We mustn't chance accidentally disarranging a single circuit. We've perhaps acquired a means of conquering space. We mustn't ruin it through carelessness. Major Montemur joined them with a camera. The electronics boys will love this, Winthrop said, pointing sternward. Catwalks crisscrossed the complicated cluster of machinery. Everything was amazingly accessible, the ductwork transparent. Strange, George, the general mused. The science that constructed this must closely parallel ours. Can't you see the similarities? Winthrop nodded. I think so. Not that I'm qualified to judge. Behind the bomb was a bulkhead shutting off the ship's forward portion in the middle of which was a great round door. Set securely in the door was a complicated instrument. The symbols on the dials and controls were utterly alien. Among the dials was what was apparently a timing device with 28 subdivisions, a slowly sweeping hand. It was silent, but Winthrop heard whispering in his mind the pounding time of the spinning planet of some other sun, and the urgency and great import of time returned to torment him. He had fought it while working on the bomb, and now he fought it again. But, he said, this part of the ship wasn't designed for entrance during spaceflight. In a pressure suit, maybe, yes. Otherwise, we can only assume that the crew doesn't require an atmosphere. Life may have evolved quite differently elsewhere. I don't believe it. 
I doubt that there's a thinking being of our equal anywhere that isn't human or humanoid. Take your own comments about the machinery. And what about the books? Books? Winthrop followed the general's gaze. Protruding from beneath the bomb's afterbody was a thick, finely bound volume lying upon a thinner, very tattered one. Picking both books up with trepidation, he examined the larger volume first. Its hard covers were marked with alien characters similar to those on the bulkhead instrument. He skimmed the pages, finding sections of either printed language or mathematics, still others of detailed schematics and precise drawings. The electronics engineers and linguists can work on this, he said. Association of the schematics with the equipment and the equipment's physical measurements and functionings with the printing may allow us to crack both math and language. The other volume was more puzzling. No cover, the general said. Page is missing, but it looks like a comic book. They thumbed through that second book, sickened by the abysmal thought that somewhere some alien artist had perverted an obviously great talent to please and amuse the immature. Their hasty perusal revealed an obviously imaginative tale of a pastoral world's invasion by the rapacious, plundering vanguard of a humanoid race with many digited, strangely jointed hands. The psych boys can have this, Winthrop said, apprehensively searching the shadows about them. They looked at the bulkhead door, then simultaneously at each other. Do you think there may be something alive in there? the general asked. Perhaps. It's pointless to try to open the door now, though. The occupants may be in suspended animation. It might be tricky to bring them out of it without harming them. We've thought of suspended animation as one solution to survival in the big jump once we've found a means of propulsion plus suspended animation. The propulsion's arrived, George. Maybe we'll find the other. We'll let the electronics men in here now. They should be able to shed some light on this equipment. As General Hill assembled the electronics men, Winthrop walked away. Associates addressed him curiously, but he merely nodded in absent-minded fashion. He was several yards from the ship when he suddenly became aware that someone was challenging him, the lieutenant he had met the night before. Just walking, Winthrop explained. He saw a gnarled, forlorn apple tree just beyond the perimeter of the guard posts. Almost pleadingly, he said, I'd like to go over there if you don't mind. Hell, I don't mind, the lieutenant said, but don't go any farther. Winthrop still clutched the picture book. A warning? A chill swept him. Was the ship indeed a coffin for the corpses of the survivors of a pastoral race who had sought to escape, but whose knowledge of time and space had not been adequate? The lieutenant was surveying him quizzically. Thanks, Winthrop said, and walked to the tree. He sat down and opened the book again. He thumbed through it repeatedly, the pictures creating a sickness in him. Hello, a little girl's voice said. Winthrop looked up. Six? Seven? He could only be sure that she was blonde and blue-eyed and had apparently come from the direction of the botanical gardens. She clutched roller skates in her arms. Hello, Winthrop said. Where are you going? To the skating rinks. Oh, you can't. They're closed. Her face grew solemn. But Mummy and Daddy said I could. She was about to cry. He felt a bachelor's inadequacy. Where are they? he asked. Over in the bot, bot. She struggled valiantly and then said, The flower gardens. She eyed the book eagerly. May I see the comics? Comics? Oh, the book. He handed it to her wordlessly, saw her eyes show immediately outright horror. He stared aghast as she threw it down and ran wildly away, her skates forgotten on the grass, her broken sobs and screams echoing back. He called after her uselessly. 
Stunned, he watched the little scurrying figure vanish along the broken road toward the botanical gardens, wishing that he could follow her and solace her, cursing himself for ever having thought of showing her the book. 3. Lunch was over, and General Hill had taken the floor. Gentlemen, while we are awaiting the occupant's awakening, or until we decide we've waited long enough, we must learn all we can. If they awake and decide to leave, we'll at least have obtained specific knowledge of how one spaceship works. We've only a vague suspicion of how the propulsion mechanism operates. But fortunately, we've found equipment very similar to ours, simpler in some respects, probably worked from transistors instead of to them. The electronics men may have a free hand, except for the bulkhead instrument. We'd better not tinker there until we're reasonably sure we know what we're doing. It may spell life or death to the crew. Some may prefer to study the books which we found, he added thoughtfully. If so, speak up. I would, Winthrop cut in. I'd like Rabin and Norris to join me. An electronics engineer should round out the group, General Hill said. OK, Lizio. Now, gentlemen, shall we go? Rabin was a practicing psychologist with a strong background in semantics, linguistics, astronomy, and a half dozen other curiously diversified sciences. Yet, as Winthrop looked at him again, there was doubt. Not as to Rabin's capability, but as to his dependability. Was it some sense of inward nervousness, something contained in himself which he could not tolerate in others? Rabin was studying the horribly graphic pictures as though each were a major work of art. Winthrop saw in the man's dark eyes something that had been in the little girl's eyes. He looked away. The other men he felt more sure of. Norris, a top physicist at White Sands, thoroughly familiar with man's attempts at spaceflight. Lizio, an electronics engineer with an alert, intelligent face, an excellent reputation. Reassured by their competence, he joined them as they bent over the larger volume. They found upon each drawing what certainly indicated a scale. Preceding the last persistently identical symbol was a tailless arrow pointing left. They quickly named the last symbol scale, and the arrow equals. I'll do some measuring, Lizio said, and left. Winthrop and Norris began listing the various symbols, noting their frequency of appearance and relative positions. An hour later, Lizio returned and began comparing his measurements with the symbols on the drawings. They're definitely drawn to different scales, he said. The symbols and measurements are not alike. That means different identifiable numbers. Lads, we can crack the math. They arrived at a unit found that 196 units equaled slightly less than one metre, and from the precisely marked drawings managed to label the symbols from 1 to 14. The 15 symbol proved to be a 14, followed by a 1. They were interrupted then, as the book was taken to the Astoria Signal Centre for photostatting. They talked, while General Hill telephonically cut red tape to have computers rushed to them. Suddenly Rabin cried, I know the ship's point of origin. He displayed the book's centre spread, a beautiful skyscape from the plundered planet's surface. The stars and constellations seemed unfamiliar at first, but as Rabin remarked their luminosities and relative positions, Norris exclaimed, Of course, Sirius! Winthrop's troubled mind soared, Sirius! over two and a half parsecs, eight and a half light-years from the solar system. Small wonder the crew was in a big sleep. Knowledge of the ship's apparent point of origin kindled a deeper fire. The necessity to find out what they could while they could. Even if the ship's occupants proved friendly, they might just be firmly reticent. The computers came, and an intense Benton Allen and his associates a young man who immediately buried his thin, bespectacled nose in the math 
and bent its thin frame to the instruments. The ship swarmed with technicians. Engineers examined the gyros and swore without hesitation that they could be duplicated. Others studied the electronics computer tied into the bulkhead instrument and its related schematics were huddled excitedly with astronomers and spatiologists. One by one, they tied the schematics and drawings to the instruments and equipment, at length realising that nothing in the volume related to the ship forward of the bulkhead. They'd been talking it over. If you were in a spaceship, Winthrop said, you'd certainly keep on hand the mechanics of what keeps your living quarters livable. There'd be another book up forward. They left it at that. Winthrop realised that with men here to whom math was sustenance, the sought-after answers might well be attained more quickly if he did not try to help further. As he went out, his gaze swept Rabin. The man's face was still drawn and pale in silent, fascinated study of the picture book. The ship again. In the bright sunlight, Winthrop asked questions while study of the stern went on apace. The bow retained its mystery. The many electronic listening devices attached forward had not recorded one decibel of sound. In his mind, the thought raced again. Was there something lurking in the bow? Something the little girl and Rabin had sensed? Some unspeakable horror from the stars? He sought the general. But... What about the bulkhead door? he asked. Are we going to open it? Not immediately, General Hill replied. The occupants will, if alive, probably come out in their own way in time. If we try to break in prematurely, we may bring on their deaths. His face grew sombre. It's a problem. The ship drifted down as if with a dead man's hand at the helm. It didn't come at that speed from origin. Someone, or something, cut its speed when it hit our atmosphere. Had it come in fast, the hull would have heated, and the occupants would have been roasted alive. Let's not force the issue. If alive, they'll come out eventually. Meanwhile, we're learning. But can we wait? Winthrop thought. Are we sensible in waiting? Four. Night. Benton Allen beckoned Winthrop to his side. You're familiar with Einstein's math, George. What do you think of this? Winthrop studied the recorded results with mounting trepidation. Similar processes, the end result would probably be E equals MC squared. Which explains the reactor and the fission bomb. We've cracked the math, George. Lizio came in at a half-run then, his eyes excited, proud with discovery. "'Gentlemen,' he said quickly, "'we could duplicate everything electronic if the ship soared away this minute. I guess we all thought we'd come across a product of a vastly more intelligent race, but their science is not superior to ours, except in application. It found anti-gravity, for one thing.' He nodded, then went on quickly. "'Something, however, puzzles us.' There's either a draftsman's error or a technician's error. One circuit leading forward should be connected to a junction box on the main power dynamo. Instead, it's connected to one of the gyro assemblies. Its function was undoubtedly intended to transmit a pulse to activate some mechanism forward, probably to arouse the crew. It probably acted on the anti-gravity apparatus instead, slowing the ship practically to a standstill and letting it drift in with the crew unawakened. The circuit's forward connections are in the bulkhead instrument, which is in part an autopilot computer. We found a punched tape, which we believe spelled Destination Earth, and would also have led to activation of the awakening apparatus. Alan can work on the related math. I've identified it with the schematics. Then perhaps will be convinced that we must correct the wiring and arouse the crew. General Hill snapped from the doorway. Lizio, we can't be hasty. 
We must not only correlate everything your electronics men find and everything the computers reveal, but recheck our findings ten times over. Incidentally, copies of the book and details of our findings have been flown to the Bureau of Standards. They're busy on it too. If the crew is dead, delay won't matter. If they've been in suspended animation across eight plus light years, delay shouldn't matter either, to them or to us. We can't try to be rescuers and wind up murderers by mistake. Three hours later, Benton Allen came again from the computers. It's undoubtedly anti gravity, he announced. I've done considerable work on magnetic lines of force and theoretical work on possible creation of force fields for use as meteor screens. This math weaves in and out of mine like a pulse across a synchroscope. I'd been incredibly close to anti-gravity myself. That one blasted equation. Amazing. Lizia has been working with others on the autopilot computer. They suspected it was oriented off the galactic hub, and the math verifies it. Dr. Englander from Paloma plotted courses to various star systems with a hub as reference point, and Lizio had the instrument punching tape from Englander's data. The unit not only plots courses to any star system in the galaxy, but apparently to any planet of any system. How could the memory bank have been developed? Have they better equipment for probing and photographing distant space? Have they known space travel for millennia and explored and catalogued the galaxy? Now, gentlemen, I hate to provoke a heated discussion, but the computers back me up. The amount of anti-gravitational energy produced should drive the ship at over 20 times light speed. Wait, Al, Winthrop said. Certainly Einstein's whole theory of... You wait, Alan said with tired exasperations. This math doesn't parallel Einstein's as we first thought. The difference is I haven't determined. The computers have done that. They do in minutes what it would take years for me to compute. Perhaps you're faster. General Hill said sharply, No arguments, please. Standards will double-check. All the computers won't err if these do. Let's assume these haven't erred. What does it mean, then? That the ship came from Sirius in about half an Earth year, Winthrop said. That it may have departed after they realised from visually observing our first atomic blast that there must be life here, probably a haven for them. Englander laughed. So they fled the beasties. Don't take your comic so seriously, George. Are you sure it's a comic? Winthrop snapped back. Ask Rabin what he thinks and Rabin screamed. Shocked, the memory of the little girl's hysteria strong in him, Winthrop spun towards Rabin and found the man's dark face suddenly vacuous. Rabin's hands were spread out, clutching the table's edge. His eyes were blank, blind. Rabin! Winthrop yelled. He slapped the man's face stingingly. The dark head rocked, but the expression did not change. A doctor administered a sedative and took Rabin away, silent, stumbling in a trance provoked, it seemed, by concentrated study of pictures too vividly drawn in some extrasolar abyss of depravity. Benton Allen returned to the computers. Winthrop followed. There was much in Winthrop's mind, then, that he had still to rationalise. At length he whispered, Al, and it was urgent then. There's more to the ship than we suspect. To the books, too. I'm not sure about Rabin. He may have been on the verge of a breakdown. The book may have simply contributed. I don't know. It's hard to be sure. I'm just getting over a breakdown myself. I studied the book, and I haven't had a decent moment's rest since the ship came. But I haven't cracked. Be that as it may, there's something wrong in all this, Al. Whatever you find from this point on, let me know about it first, please. Alan turned quickly from the computer, peering owlishly over its glasses. Why, George? He searched Winthrop's tense face. A crazy hunch, Al. Just let me know. I will, Alan promised. But, damn it, man, stop giving me the creeps. 
Five. It was nearly midnight, but no one moved toward his cot. Most of those who had witnessed Rabin's collapse could not sleep. Winthrop himself felt he would never sleep again. General Hill came from the telephone. Rabin's resting comfortably, he said. His personal physician confirms Dr. Vigdeman's suspicion that he had been receiving psychiatric treatment. The casualty, then, is a normal one. It might have happened anywhere, any time. We can't attribute it to some baleful alien influence. What about the little girl? Winthrop was tempted to ask. Surely there was no imbalance there. Now, the general said, dismissing the tragedy of Rabin from his mind. Let's sum up. We've progressed beautifully. We have anti-gravity here, and proof that the speed of light can be exceeded. Standards fully verifies Allen's findings. Tomorrow, those most eminently qualified should try to determine how the bulkhead door may be opened. The general staff has just ordered that it must be opened within 48 hours. All precautions will of course be taken to obviate damage to the ship. How about to us? Winthrop asked sharply. The general ignored him. Now let's call it a day. You must all be as tired as I am. Stick with me, Al, Winthrop whispered urgently. Aloud, he said, Dr. Allen and I would like to go over the data now. We believe we've found the key to the door and that... The general laughed. If you're that close, George, it can wait until morning. I disagree, Winthrop cut in sharply. Time may be of the essence. How do we know whether the occupants are of the pastoral race or the other race depicted in that ghastly comic book? If they are anti-gravity and fission bombs, what else may they have up forward? Let's not be pessimistic, General Hill said. If they had come meaning harm, they'd have set their awakening apparatus properly. They'd not have erred if they'd come with evil intent. Let's not drag in a monstrous hint of invasion. If you wish to keep on, well and good. I'm for the cot. Good night, gentlemen. 6. Why can't it wait, George? Benton Allen asked tiredly. You'd better let me ask the questions, Winthrop urged. You said you understood that autopilot computer. Do you think we could send the ship back? Yes, Allen said. The tape can be reversed. The computer would compensate for elapsed time and orbital factors. Will you help me? Slowly Allen removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. That would be the height of stupidity. We've a sferkable spaceship here. If we send it back without awaiting the awakening of its occupants, we'd be acting like congenital idiots. Put your glasses back on, Winthrop said irritably. His right forefinger stabbed at the schematics, drawings, translated math. Add it up, Mr. Computer. For a long moment, Alan stared in silence. Then, suddenly... Realization blanched his face. The trees for the forest, he murmured. Let's go, George. The sentry halted them at the ship's port, but passed them quickly when they told him their mission was urgent. But as they entered the ship, they heard him calling for the officer of the day. Alan attacked the autopilot computer, inserting the reversed tape carefully. Winthrop, with utmost care, rearranged the wiring in accordance with the construction charts and replaced everything else as it had been on the ship's arrival. Agreed? Winthrop asked. Agreed, said Benton Allen. They left the ship hurriedly, fastening the port securely behind them. A moment later, the triumph came. It was not a triumph to the general. In stunned horror and desperation, he watched the gleaming ship lift silently, slowly into the cool night air over Flushing Meadow Park, a monstrous silver gourd stippled with star bright. "'What have you done, man?' he cried. "'We sent it back, Bert,' Winthrop said with a calmness he had not felt in years. "'But why? Why? What in God's name shall I tell the general staff?' The simple truth, Winthrop told him. 
we reviewed the data and reached an inescapable conclusion. But when it came, the disarranged circuitry cut into the anti-gravity mechanism and landed it safely, as we suspected. Had it been wired properly, something forward would have been awakened, I'm sure of that. The math explained the autopilot computer, the anti-gravity mechanism, the reactor, the fission bomb, and something sinister. The history book, not comic book, showed where the ship originated, and it also showed clearly who launched it. The math is based on 14 symbols. The invaders in the history book have seven-fingered hands, the pastoral folk five. Steadily, Winthrop returned the general stare. I shouldn't have said ship. It wasn't designed for passengers or crew. We thought the forward portion wasn't described. But it was, in the same equations that explained the reactor and the fission bomb. We use fission bombs to detonate fusion bombs. The missile's warhead contains a fusion bomb which the math proves would have caused a spontaneous carbon chain reaction which would almost instantaneously have wiped out the Earth. Through a technician's error, it came to Earth a dud. Its launchers will never know that. It will be back where it belongs twenty times quicker than the light now leaving Sol, and it's no longer a dud. They all were silent then. You licked it, Winthrop told himself when you armed the greatest bomb. Verification of classification came almost nine years later. Then a flare-up of near-nova intensity was noted in Sirius, the finest photographs being obtained by Englander in New Palomar Observatory on Pluto. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. The Deadly Ones by F. L. Wallace Originally published in Fantastic Universe, July 1954 Narrated by Tom Trussell Rathston. I'm sure the name means nothing to you. There are legends, of course, from old Germany and the Greater Reich, colonial America even, but you can't prove anything very damaging or concrete with legends. And even when the story is otherwise correct, I've been careful to keep my name out of it. A clever person shuns publicity, though it may involve tampering with history. For all practical purposes, the name Rathston is unknown. I want it kept that way. I can't remember when the inspiration came. Probably it had lain for a long time dormant in the back of my mind, like a mole hibernating in midwinter. Warmed by the proper circumstances, it emerged at last in its full vigour to claim my attention. I've always worked hard, but lately what I got out of my efforts you couldn't call a living. The Red Cross was largely responsible. You could never get me to say a good word for that agency. Never. Still, I have made use of them, and in this case they made their contribution, though it was an unwitting one. I gave the idea careful thought. From the beginning I knew I needed help. I'm not superhuman, not in the strict sense, though I suppose I could give a good account of myself against Wells's invisible man, Homo Superior, or the new crop of mutants that will spring up some day soon. I needed help, and I carried the problem to a council of my fellows. We discussed it thoroughly, and in the end, though they didn't give me their blessing, they consented to aid me. The problem was flying saucers, or rather, how to force one to land. We debated the matter for a long time, but there didn't seem to be any way to do it. 
No jet could keep up with a saucer and present rockets were equally inadequate. Besides, we didn't have access to any of these machines. Someone in the back of the council, whose name I didn't catch, suggested that, if we couldn't force one to land, perhaps we could lure one down. It didn't matter how, as long as it remained on the ground for an hour or so, with its ports open. The rest would be up to me. Fine, I said. What do you propose? They're investigating, you know, he said, in the western part of the country. Rocket bases, atom bomb sites, anything that indicates advanced technology. Let's give them another menace. Sounds good. What are they interested in? He was a hard fellow to locate, and I didn't try to visualize his face. He came from Ireland, I believe. A spaceship, he said. A very formidable creation, with an incredible drive. There was nothing wrong with a basic concept. The ship wouldn't be real, of course. It would merely seem real from the air. We could accomplish that. As for the drive, we could manage that too. In a little investigated part of the spectrum we could create a low and steady output, suggesting that the drive was idling, ready for instant takeoff. None of this was impossible for us. We? Have I said that we're not human? We've existed for a long time on Earth beside Homo sapiens, and he has only dimly guessed that we are here. The ordinary limitations of men don't apply to us. A few of us working together could create an illusionary spaceship, an intriguing drive to go with it. This was something flying saucers couldn't resist. They'd come down where they found they couldn't investigate from their customary high-level flights. I nodded at the fellow I couldn't see. Excellent. However, when the saucer lands you'll have to maintain the illusion. Logistics are involved too. That's easy, he said. But what if it isn't manned by robots, as you've assumed? You can get inside all right, but a living creature will discover you. I looked at the blank spot where I thought he might be. Really now? It has to be a robot. No living creature, except us, can stand the accelerations we've observed. But what if we're wrong? he persisted. In that case, We'll have time for one quick look, I said. If it is living and we're no match for it, we'll run like hell. There was general laughter, and the fellow raised no further objections. For all I know, he went home. The meeting broke up, and everyone except a few volunteers left. We continued to discuss ways and means. When the plans seemed foolproof, I got up. Just a minute! Another fellow I didn't recognize interposed. Suppose everything works the way you say it will. The saucer lands, and you succeed in getting inside. What makes you think it'll go back to the home planet? Don't overlook our fake spaceship, I said. If the robot investigator from the saucer found a real spaceship, that would be important information. It would be important enough to warrant a quick trip back to the local base, wherever that may be situated. But when the robot can't locate anything, in spite of the evidence on the instruments, it will be dealing with top priority stuff. Logically, it will have to report back to the Prime Evaluation Centre on the home planet. I think I'm safe in anticipating a short journey. I hope so, he shook his head dubiously. But what about us? We don't have to worry about humans and probably those things out there haven't come close enough to learn about us. But they're pretty advanced. What if they should? You think they can detect us when we're dematerialized? I smiled. Don't be naive. Anyway, nothing risked, you know? I shouldn't have said that. I talk too much. Nothing gained, he completed the sentence for me. He didn't look altruistic. Just what do we stand to gain? The others hadn't thought of it, and neither had I, from that angle. I ad-libbed. It's not been good here lately. There's too many factors against us, agencies that I don't have to mention. 
feast or famine, mostly the last. And what are we going to do after an atomic war when mutants come along? Are you sure we can compete with them? As bad as it is now, it can get worse. I paused to let the dire predictions sink in. Someone has to do it, and I intend to be the one to find new worlds for us, I said. My confidence impressed the others, but not the heckler. I can see that you'll find it for yourself, but how are you going to let us know? Just now, I can't communicate from here to Philadelphia, I said. It's a harassing business, merely trying to stay alive. Here, I haven't had time to practice mental communication. But there, conditions will be ideal, and I expect to develop myself so that I can reach out anywhere in the galaxy. Objectively, that was true. Subjectively, I could have changed my mind about sharing my prize. They didn't think of that, and I didn't mention it. The last objection was silenced. They went about their preparations, and I about mine. We set up the decoy in Illinois. No real reason, I suppose, except that most of us are allergic to desert, the logical place to build spaceport and ships. Deserts are hot, dry, and bright, and there are few humans there. In our own way, we're fond of men, though they may not think so. Illinois it was, and if there was a note of incongruity in it, so much the better. A spaceship looked strange in the middle of the flat cornfields. Very well, it did. Let the robot investigator find out why it was there. The creation was not difficult. There was a haze in the air, and the fields were green, and the spaceship pointed a sleek nose toward the sky. It was impalpable from below. A farmer ploughed right through the stern tubes without knowing they were there. An inconvenience only. We blacked him out as seen from above. The farmhouse we converted into a control tower, and the barn became a disembarkation structure. There were side manifestations, of course. Dogs growled uneasily and barked, then ran away and hid in the woods. Roosters could not crow, nor hens lay eggs. Milk curdled in cows and cans, and all the butter turned rancid. Unfortunately, we don't often use our entire minds, and when we do, there are peripheral effects. However, no human in the area noticed us, and life went on pretty much as usual. Radio reception was poor over all North America, and television was disrupted for a thousand miles. The disruption was deliberately planned. We had to attract the attention of the sources, and that was the easiest way to do it. The radiation was supposed to represent a power leak from a hypothecated interstellar drive. They came the second night, and it was good they did. The strain was telling on everyone in the project. It's not easy to keep up such big illusion. The flight of saucers wheeled across the sky, lights out and undoubtedly ready for action. They had located us all right, and they wanted to see just what it was we had. But they couldn't find out from the air, no matter how many times they passed over. It must have been quite a jolt. They had Earth all pegged down to the last improvement in a self-locking nut, and suddenly, here was something new which didn't belong. Toward midnight, with five of them still skimming the clouds, the sixth came down. I was ready, and had everything I needed with me. The saucer landed in a field a half-mile away. The vegetation burned invisibly where it settled. A section of the saucer opened, and a much littler saucer came out. The little saucer was a robot. I was sure of that the instant I saw it, mostly because it had wheels. There is nothing to indicate that a life-form can't have wheels, but it does pose a nice problem for what a living creature will use for bearings. It was a robot then, and it came out and headed for our ship, which was still holding together splendidly, needle-nose aimed at the sky. It was time for me to go to work, 
I started toward the big saucer. It's coming closer. This was the thought of the individual who had created the ship out of his own dematerialized atoms. Put out a force field and keep it away. He sounded shaky, and I thought a wry jest would help. The containers I was carrying were heavy. The ship snorted. I wish I could, but seriously, how long do I have to stay here? Keep it up, I said. I've got lots of supplies. The terror in his voice was real. I don't like that thing. It's snooping around. Waken the farmer. Maybe he'll kick up a disturbance and the robot will investigate. With a shotgun, the farmer couldn't do much, but a lucky shot might put a wheel out of commission. The robot wouldn't like that. I can't make the farmer open his eyes. The saucer put him to sleep and I can't touch his mind. The saucers had a good brand of hypnotism, if that's what it was. We knew they had space travel, and now it was evident that they were equally advanced in other ways. Use your judgment, I told the ship. Hold it as long as you can, and then pretend to go out into space, or forward in time. Anything that would look good. I needed time. I could have dematerialized where I stood, and rematerialized inside the saucer. But if I did, I would have to leave most of my supplies behind. A short journey, I had said. And that was true short as far as interstellar distances were concerned. But it would be long by normal methods of reckoning, and I had to live through it. I couldn't abandon my supplies. I succeeded in transponding all the food to a place just outside the large saucer before our ship disappeared. It didn't go out into space, nor into time as I expected. Instead, it sank rapidly into the ground and left no hole behind. This, I think, confused the robot. I heard it thrashing around in the cornfield, possibly in bewilderment. I gathered some of the containers and carried them inside the saucer. It was lighted all right, and the lighting scheme was as weird as the interior. They used the spectrum below the red and above the violet. Why this should be so, I don't know. I merely report what I found. Apparently, they didn't react to what we consider visible light. I adjusted my eyes. I found an empty space, which I assumed was for the storage of specimens. I put my food in there. Outside, I went for more, and then back again. I repeated my trips until everything was loaded. Unpalatable food, of course, concentrated and not tasty but it would last until I stepped out on the planet at the opposite end. After that, there would be other problems. I went outside for the last communication with my fellows, the ship I could examine later. I looked around. The control tower and disembarkation structure were still visible, though they were wavering in the dim light. Are you there? I thought. I am, the control tower thought back. I wish I wasn't. It's just a robot, I said reassuringly. It's not interested in a building. Maybe not, conceded the control tower, but it's inside, examining sleeping people. I wish it would go away. He was losing control of himself, and that didn't suit my purpose. It's just a machine. Hold on for a little longer. He held on. The robot left the illusionary control tower and headed toward the saucer. For a squat, ungainly contrivance, it covered the distance in an amazing fashion. I had barely time to get inside before it rumbled into the saucer. It was carrying something. We took off before I could see what it was. We left Earth smoothly, though any kind of takeoff would have suited me. Inertia had never been my problem. Neither was the possibility that the robot would discover me. I was certain I didn't register on light-sensitive cells, and I had other tricks I could use if I had to. The robot had tentacles I hadn't noticed before, because they had been retracted. They weren't retracted now, and they held a farmer. He was unconscious. 
The robot was monkeying around with the farmer, but it was hardly the time to interfere. Needles stabbed the farmer in several places, withdrawing the blood and storing it, probably inside the robot. The first needles were jerked out and replaced by others. Again, this was logical. Pumping a fluid into the farmer's veins with the intent of suspending the life force until they reached the home planet. The whole procedure made sense. When the robot couldn't find the spaceship, it had taken someone in the vicinity for questioning. They'd be surprised what they'd learn from the farmer, though. Absolutely nothing. We had protected ourselves too well. The farmer's ordeal had no bearing on the success of my enterprise. Nevertheless, I became slightly ill at the waste involved. The robot dropped the farmer in a place similar to the one in which I had hidden my supplies. Then it crouched down and became motionless, waiting. There was nothing for it to do. Nor for myself, either. We were out of the atmosphere and on our way. The journey was six months of monotony. Avoiding the robot was easy, because it didn't move. The ship was all mine, but I couldn't make use of it. I puttered around, but there was nothing much to learn. The drive was in operation, and as long as it was, I couldn't get close. I had no idea of what it was, nor how it worked but the force that surrounded it was, for me at least, an absolute barrier. The rest of the saucer were equally confounding. There were several low-ceilinged compartments which held instruments at whose function I could not guess. There were no star charts anywhere, but I had to assume the ship knew where it was going. Whatever our destination, we were approaching it faster than light. Occasionally I looked out of the vision ports, and what I saw didn't resemble suns, though of course they were. It was the light shaft which changed their appearance. One day the saucer gave a lurch, and we were simultaneously below the speed of light and near our goal. Dead ahead was a multiple star system. Where it lay with relation to Earth, I don't know. Within fifty to a thousand light-years, I suppose. For the first time in months, the robot stirred, went to the farmer, and began to work on him. I kept out of the way. It seemed the sensible thing to do. No matter how often I looked, I couldn't determine the location of the planet toward which we were bound. The ship knew, but I was in ignorance. From behind, in the next compartment, came the laboured sounds of the robot. Then there was another sound, and it didn't come from the robot. I looked in. The farmer sat up, gazed around, understood some or little of what he saw. That understanding was enough for him. He collapsed. He was still breathing, though, in spasmodic gasps. The revivification was a complete success. I decided to keep the man in mind. He was an important source of reserve strength. My hopes leapt high when I saw the planet, it was something less than the size of Saturn, but much larger than Earth. It was large enough to support a tremendous population. I hadn't bargained for anything so good. I had only a vague plan to go by. I had made the journey in complete safety, and that was most important. My next move would depend on circumstances. I could dematerialize myself off the ship and onto the planet. With an extreme expenditure of energy, I could even take the remainder of my food supply with me. But it didn't seem worth the effort. I had done all right so far by remaining quiet and letting events occur as they would. I decided to see it through on the same basis. I stayed in the ship and let it land. That was not my first mistake, landing with the ship. If anything, the error began a thousand years earlier, in my infancy, the first night I saw the light of the moon. No one asked me to come. I did it voluntarily, for reasons my total personality found acceptable. In my own mind, 
I added up the advantages in leaving Earth, and then schemed until I found a way to do it. I had been dissatisfied with the way things were going among men. I objected to blood spilled uselessly. And so I had contrived an escape. Greener pastures? Not exactly. I don't like salads. Still, the saying conveys something of the way I felt. Long before the ship landed, it was too late, though I didn't know it. The robot scurried about the saucer, chirruping mechanically and creaking. When it finished the duties, it picked up the farmer and carried him out. The man was still unconscious, but he began to scream. Soon after it left, other robots came into the ship. Slightly different from the kind I had seen, they must have been repair robots. They went about tasks that were unfamiliar to me, and they talked. This was new. I couldn't understand what they said until I found the speech centre of one and let my mind reach out lightly. A master says there is a stowaway on one of the ships. It was unforeseen. Nothing I had encountered could detect my existence without registering on my consciousness. These masters were going to be tougher than humans. I waited while the other replied. Do they know what ship he's on? My robot waved a tentacle. There are ten thousand ships here, each waiting for a checkover before reassignment. Would they bother to search each ship? Physically, you mean? asked the other. No, they will take him off as the ship leaves. Getting me off was going to take some doing, though the masters didn't know it. They may have gauged humans correctly, but they hadn't met me. Nevertheless, I was uneasy. Why does he stay on the ship? asked my robot. The other chuckled. Maybe he's changed his mind and wants to go home. He'll be surprised when he learns where he's bound for. I'll admit I panicked then, because a robot chuckled. It's not the friendly sound you might think, and also because of what it said. I had no intention of going home, but I liked to think I could if I wanted to. Now I saw that, due to their system of rotating assignments, it was next to impossible to determine which ship was going back to Earth. I made up my mind quickly. Several things happened simultaneously. I dematerialized myself where I was, and rematerialized tenuously inside the robot. At the same time, I took control of its motor and brain centers. I forced it away from the job, and commanded it to go to the storage space where the last of my food was hidden. The other robot didn't notice. I surmised they didn't take orders from each other, but from someone above. For the moment, I was above. Out of the ship we went, and into the confusion of the repair shops. Nothing but ships and robots, and I had enough of these. I needed a hiding place to rest, and plan my forays against the creatures of this planet. I rummaged hurriedly through the robot brain and learned that we were near the edge of a large city. Without cataloguing all the information I received, I forced the robot through obscure alleys toward the open plain that surrounded the city. It was cramped and uncomfortable inside the robot, even though I didn't exist as solid matter, and I had to operate blind. I couldn't adjust my sight to that of the robot, and had to function once removed from reality, through its incomplete senses. The last alley we entered ended on the open plain. The robot rolled down it, and stopped. I couldn't see what was in front of us, but I could guess. One of the creatures of the planet, the things that made the flying saucers. Without hesitation I directed the robot to attack. It didn't. Its refusal was not unexpected. They would have been quite insane to build robots without installing some safeguards. It meant, however, that the next step was up to me. I took it. I dematerialized out of the robot and rematerialized facing my antagonist. On the average, 
It takes me a few microseconds to evaluate a foe and find his weakness. I looked longer than that. It was the first time I had seen anything that could destroy at a glance my confidence in my own survival capacity. And there was no weakness. What I did then was not cowardice. It was pure survival, the reaction of a nervous system shocked to the limits of endurance. I dematerialized myself from where I stood and rematerialized far out on the open plain. Twice I repeated the process until the city was out of sight over the horizon. The creature didn't follow, though it could have done so easily enough, if it had wanted to. I know my strength. On earth it's the source of legends, the shadowy half-believed stories of werewolves and vampires, fact and fancy mixed together to chill the minds and hearts of men. For myself, and others like me, it's a distinct advantage to have our existence doubted. A victim paralysed with fear, too shocked and demoralised to cry out, is easier to subdue. But the strength I was so confident of is meaningless here. Crouched in the shadow of the boulder, the only shade on the arid plain, it suddenly dawned on me that the creatures who ruled this planet knew about me from the beginning, when I thought I was hidden. It amused them, I think. I can't go back to the city and find the farmer. He is their meat, and I have limitations. I can't dematerialize myself off this planet. A few drops of fluid are left in the container with the red cross stamp on it, my last link with earth. I was born knowing the facts of my life. For a thousand years I have taken my food where and how I could get it. But these creatures are different, not only in body chemistry. They have tougher than Teflon skin and have hydrofluoric acids in their veins. I've always killed for food, but they kill for pleasure. And their appearance exactly coincides with their character. I ought to know. But there's one escape they forgot about, and I will take it. When they come hunting, they won't find me. Self-destruction is preferable to meeting those horrors face to face again. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Master Race by Richard Ashby Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, September 1951 Narrated by Tom Trusser One moment he was piloting a fast plane over dangerous green jungles, and the next Eddie was wide awake and peering through the gloom. Across the room, Rags was whining softly and sniffing the damp night air that rolled in through the open window. The Scotty was excited, Eddie saw, and it must be something out of the ordinary for Rags whimpering carried an undercurrent of perplexity and fear, and the dog wasn't a coward. The boy called softly to him, but Rags, after tossing back a swift glance of recognition, put his forefeet up on the sill and peered, muttering, out across the pastures. Eddie slipped from his bed and padded over to the window. As he comfortingly ruffled the fur behind the Scotty's ears, he listened intently at the night. At first he heard only the ordinary country sounds, roosters crowing over at the next farm, the muffled thumping of stock shifting about in the barn, and against the corral fence, the flittering and high chirping of birds in the cottonwoods and pepper trees. He took the dog in his arms, and was about to go back to bed with him when he became aware of a sound that was very much out of the ordinary. A sound, Eddie decided, something like standing outside the Baptist church in Riverside when the organist was playing low, vibrant notes inside. Eddie wondered how he could have first missed the sound, so firmly had it now become established. Where could it be coming from? 
It was, he guessed, about an hour till dawn, and no tractors or other farm machinery should be running, and it wasn't a radio. A plane? Leaning from the window, he glanced upwards, then gasped in astonishment. Goose pimples of excitement tingled his skin, for there in the sky, above the oak tree on the ridge, hung a pattern of sharp white lights. There were little lights, as if someone had strung together a fanciful arrangement of Christmas tree bulbs, then set them dangling aloft beneath a kite. Rags' mutterings became a deep and angry. Finally he gave vent to a sharp, sharp bark. Instantly Eddie quieted the dog. Lights or not, his mother had made it plenty clear about Rags being in the house. Crouching on the floor, both arms about Rags, Eddie whispered words of reassurance while he stared up at the strange sparklings. The oak tree, the one with his tree house, was a scant quarter mile from where he knelt, and he wondered if it was being so high on the ridge had caused it to draw some sort of lightning to itself. He'd read of that happening. Chain lightning. Or was it called foxfire? Eddie couldn't remember. Anyway, it looked something like that, he imagined. But no lightning, he remembered, made a noise like a machine. Unconsciously, he hooked sight and sound together. Frowning, Eddie let go of the dog. If the lights had been over the barn or garage, he had gone to tell his father. Or over the garden, his mother. But the treehouse didn't concern them. It was his, and even if it hadn't been an hour before dawn, he wouldn't have told his parents. He had things in there he shouldn't have and it wouldn't do for either mother or father to go snooping around, even if they couldn't find his secret ladder and climb it. He returned to the window. Something thrashed in the highest branches of the oak. Rags began his whining again. There was but one thing to do. He found his moccasins by the night table and pulled them on, threw a leather jacket on over his pyjamas. From the wall above his desk, Eddie took down his point twenty two broke it, slipped in a shell, and tiptoed from the house. The humming was stronger outside, not louder exactly, but more easy to feel. He crouched down, the way he'd seen commandos do in pictures, and began to run, holding the rifle at ready before him. And for once, Rags seemed content to stay at his side and not go dashing along ahead up the path. As they took the turn by the big rock, a startled night bird plunged out of the bushes and took wing. The bird's violent rush brought caution to Eddie, and he slowed his run to a walk. Suppose, he thought, that someone in a helicopter, or maybe a balloon, was hanging over the treehouse. Spies, probably. And suppose they wanted the treehouse for a headquarters. He stopped, looked back down at the house dimly outlined in the starlight. Suppose, he continued, that there were too many of them. He'd just better sneak up quiet and see what was going on. He eased himself around another turn in the path and came again in view of the oak. The lights were still there, but they no longer looked to be mere points of brightness against an empty sky. He stopped, more puzzled than ever. They looked like navigation lights on the ship, and a couple of them like the glow from inside a radio and all of them were swaying gently in the night wind, twenty feet or so above the tree. Rags went slowly ahead, two feet, three, four, then stopped, belly almost to the dust. His teeth shone in a soundless snarl, not a muscle of his body moving. Eddie had never seen him act like this, not even when the bear had come down into the valley to raid for chickens. Rags was plainly terrified, and something of the dog's emotion communicated itself. The boy bit his lip grimly, then strained to listen, heard what the dog was hearing. Someone, something, was moving about up in the oak. Some of his fear gave way to anger. Messing about in my treehouse, he gripped the rifle tightly, took two determined steps forward. The third step he never completed. He was unconscious when he pitched into the ground, and when Rags leapt after him, he too crumpled as if dead. 
The commander left his report strewn desk and strode heavily over to the forward port. Glumly he looked down at the frosty pitted surface of the satellite a thousand miles away, and in his imagination saw the planet that swung on the dead orb's opposite side. It was nonsense to have to hide behind a moon from such a primitive planet, waiting and waiting like a coward for reassuring information. But such prudence had ever been part of holy law. He sighed, turned away from the huge wall of window. Sometimes one wondered about law, he mused darkly. One did not disobey, of course, but one could not help wondering sometimes, and occasionally one even wondered the blackest heresy of all. Was it really important to kill all life everywhere for the sake of colonization? The commander caught sight of his reflection in a polished door panel. His own hard eyes glowered out from the reflection accusingly, so he pulled up his shoulders and put all suspicion from his mind. Would he not destroy any of his people for such thoughts? then he must not allow himself to entertain such blasphemy. Naturally, colonization was all-important. That was law. Picking up the pictures taken when they had first flashed into this system, the commander saw again the nature of the beings they were about to exterminate. That they were ignorant savages, quite unworthy of the usual precautions now being taken, was plain to see. Their atmosphere showed heavy traces of carbon combustion, a certain indication that the creatures were inefficient, for who but a savage would burn matter to obtain power? The amount of radioactivity present in their gaseous envelope was so tiny as to prove that they had little or no knowledge of atomic power. There were no frail vibrations apparent. Imagine existing without an understanding of simple magnetics. He picked up an enlargement of one portion of a lad mass, put a hand magnetic lens over it, the magnification showed clusters of dwellings linked together by lines and double lines upon the ground, certainly the ultimate proof of low-order civilization, when beings chose to live clustered together, commuting by land, when they could spread themselves out over the surface of the planet and use the roads of the sky. The commander made a sign in the air with his fingers, and a door popped open at the end of the vast room. An aide ran towards the desk, halted, covered his face in salute. Sir, how long has the scout been gone? The aide removed his hands from his eyes. A day and a night, sir. He should be back any time now. Fool! the commander roared out the word. Did I ask for your guesses? I know he's due back. He is, in fact, one hour overdue. He did not know if this was or was not true, but it was good discipline policy. Lock him away when he arrives. The other covered his face respectfully. Yes, sir. He turned, ran from the desk and out the door. For a few minutes the commander kept busy by calling the ten ray centres of the three-mile-long ship, demanding to know if they were ready to beam. They were. He then spent a while ordering all unit leaders to hold their sections in readiness for inertialist drive. The unit leaders protested politely that they were. He called engine, commanded that they look sharp. Meekly they assured him that all was well. With only small satisfaction, the commander rose from his desk, paced slowly over to the port again. As he gazed out at the moon's bland surface, he reflected that there was something about this nine-planet system they were in that made him edgy, made him want to keep active and alert. And where was that thrice-blasted scout? He decided to have him flogged when he returned. Good discipline policy. The scout woke from his drunken sleep and glanced at the clock on the dash of his little craft. It was very late, he saw. He would have to think of a fine excuse when he returned or they would put him in truth and learn that all scouts took the precious freedom of voyagers to become intoxicated for a while. Not much time. He would have to take what he could find in the vicinity. A small difference it made, though, since the beings of the planet were surely doomed. The scout yawned, then lifted the ship from the mountain and arrowed it down into the folds of the valley. His visor translated the immediate night into light, 
showing him the typically repugnant surface features of a Type J planet. Foliage, sharp young geology, water flowing in natural beds, a world like a hundred others he'd visited in the name of law. When the floor of the valley came up, he levelled off, then silently sped along in search of dwellings. Beneath him, on level stretches of land, stood odd four-legged creatures. The dominance of this world, he wondered. Probably not. The extremities of their limbs appeared to be too blunt and crude to do even the simple tooling he'd noticed during his flight in. Beasts of transport, no doubt. Boldly, he swooped low over a group, scattering them in panic. The meadow ended with almost sheer mountain wall, and the scout whipped his craft up its face and down the opposite side. Something flickered in his vision screen, and he swung the controls. A dwelling. In a moment he was back over it, hanging motionless. Sure enough, a revolting crude shack that nestled high in the branches of one of this world's surface growths. This was it. There was no time nor need to search further. He locked the controls, then turned on the deadly screen that would kill all life directly beneath, save one probably shielded, such as himself, and would stun all life attempting to enter the edges of the field. Pulling on his helmet, the scout reached to the stud at his belt and reduced his weight to but a fraction of itself, and he opened the hatch and clambered out into the air. His first few minutes of exploration in the treehouse were disappointing. There was no life, no corpses about for him to dissect and study, but the hunting club puzzled him. Obviously tooled by machinery and scuffed from much killing, it bore what might be a world blunt into its thickened end. Spalding. He realised he was in an extremely primitive section of the planet, for this weapon was, no doubt, a trade article from some more advanced portion of the globe. Too bad he'd had to land in this region, dull. The club he chucked into the bag over his shoulder. A round object, made of some fairly soft material, with seams twisting over its surface next caught his eye. He took it up, shook it. It too bore the symbol, Spalding. Probably a totem word, perhaps the sign of this particular tribe. He put it with the club. It was followed by a small package of soft white cylinders which were stuffed with crumbles of dried weed. Each cylinder bore the sign Camel, as did the container, which also showed a beast somewhat like those he had buzzed. And beyond that there was nothing. A simple people indeed, he pondered. He was about to leave when he noticed the stack of artefacts in one corner. The scout bent to examine them. They seemed to be composed of the same material as the white of the camel cylinders, but thicker and bound together in long, wide, flat construction. There were bright colours on the outside of each, and just as he discovered that the individual leaves of material could be separated and turned, the alarm bell sounded twice in his helmet. Life had blundered into the outer edges of his field. Hastily the scout put a score of his latest finds into his sack and left the treehouse, and without bothering to search for the life that had triggered his alarm, law specified a scout was to flee in such an instance. He adjusted his weight and rode up to his waiting ship. Minutes later he had passed the world satellite and was in view of his parent craft. The commander's first action was to order the scout flogged before his comrades as an example of what awaited those who became lax in the performance of important duties. His second was to assemble the council of experts. When the eight old men had taken their places about the table, the commander saluted them in the name of law and summoned his aid. Is the contamination through? It is, sir. Then have the findings brought in. The officer ran from the room and returned in a moment with the scout's bulging sack. Gently he placed it in the centre of the round table before the council. After saluting, he took his leave again. Gentlemen, began the commander, we are met again to pass judgment on a corrupt, life-harbouring planet. By the authority vested in me through the line of my father, I charge you with the voice of law. 
and so on and so on, were the ancient words of the ritual. The eight old experts hardly listened. They had sat through countless identical sessions during the hundreds of years of their lives. Theirs was but to view the oddities that would presently be arranged before them, make mental records of their descriptions, and offer one or two tentative guesses as to the nature of the articles. But in any event, the action that followed would be the same. The creatures responsible for the articles would shortly be snuffed out, in the glorious and awful name of law. So they hardly listened. When the commander had finished with the rites of the occasion, he unsnapped the bag and, after peering within it, gingerly brought out the scout's first find. Only now did the old men appear to take much notice. A few even leant forward slightly. All eyes centred on what their commander held. "'A phallic object?' asked the youngest. "'No, a lever,' said the eldest. "'For killing,' added the next. "'But it was made by machine,' put in a fourth. For a moment they were silent. The commander placed the machine-made killing lever on the table. It described a short little half-roll, bringing the printing into view. "'A religious design,' said the youngest, "'obviously pagan, but rather well worked.' No one found anything further to say, so the commander brought forth from the bag the next object. A mild flurry of interest ensued when it was discovered that this soft globular thing bore the same religious design, but the sages would not venture an opinion as to the thing's purpose. So the commander took out the package of white cylinders. Only the next to the eldest made any comment. He claimed that he had seen such articles in his youth brought out from a system for three worlds that swung above a nova. The white things there, he reminisced, were units of value, useful in bartering. They were designed to be spent quickly, lest the stuffing fall out. The other experts agreed that these were no doubt also monies. The commander had been listening with but half an ear. Privately he had long considered the experts to be but a muttering pack of senile dolts, dead weight, useless cargo on the ship. They worked not, neither did they breed, but law demanded their presence. The law, he mused, seemed strange at times. He discovered the council was waiting for him. Frowning to cover his embarrassment, he took out the last of the scout's finds. For a moment all of them were struck by the bright colours on the flat surface. The one old man reached out a trembling hand. "'Records!' he murmured incredulously. "'Records such as our own race is said to have once made, long, long ago, before law!' Reverently he examined the cover, then with remarkable agility for one so decrepit, he jumped to his feet and flung the thing from him, his face twitched with horror. The others, shocked and disbelieving, fell to examining the rest of the new articles. In a moment, cries of alarm filled the council room. Chairs were upset, dignity forgotten. Only the eldest retained his composure, although with difficulty, for he could hardly manage to control the palsied shaking of his hands. The astonished commander leaned over his shoulder and watched as the ancient turned the pages. What he saw made the blood drum in his ears, made his vision swim, and only faintly did he hear the old one's croaking words, praise to law which we so carelessly accepted for law has saved us from the fiendish denizens of this planet had we attempted to exterminate them their space armadas would have taken instant revenge for they are obviously mightier than we he put down the bright record of spacecraft vaster than the one which they occupied and took up another on its cover was depicted a world being blasted into flaming wreckage and within was shown the pictorial history of a space fleet engaged in repelling an alien invasion and who followed up their successful repulse by annihilating the entire system of the aliens. Five more of the record books did they examine before the commander's stunned mind at last reeled beneath the hideous concepts and it could look no more. 
Dumbly, he managed to reach the phones and order the ship through into emergency drive to some far and lost point in space and dimension. And as he waited for the shuddering wrench that signalled interdimensional shift, he tried to forget the horrors they had so narrowly escaped. Creatures who could make themselves invisible, who had mastered space travel, who worked in magic more powerful than that of laws, who could whiff out entire solar systems, who could survive incredible mishaps and hardships. Creatures who were no less than gods. A wave of fear tore at the commander as the glittering moon faded away. Eternal nothingness of grey enclosed the ship. The sun was up when Eddie recovered consciousness. Stiff and cold, he sat and looked around sleepily for a moment before remembering. Then, as he saw Rags sitting before him, tail wagging happily, it all began to come back. Last night, sometime, humming lights above the treehouse, someone moving about up there, himself sneaking up to see, then nothing. He must have tripped and knocked himself out, somehow. Eddie snatched up the twenty-two and aimed it at the tree. "'Whoever's up there,' he said, getting to his feet, "'had better come on out.' Nothing happened. Eddie bent down cautiously, his eyes still fixed on the treehouse, picked up a rock and hurled it through the shanty's open door. A bird fluttered from the gnarled oak, sailed across the morning meadow, chirping angrily. "'This is your last chance. Come on out, or I'm coming up and get you!' The birds being there made him quite sure that everything was all right, so after a moment he pulled the knotted rope from its concealment in a cleft of the tree and went up hand over hand. A strange odour lingered inside the shack. Something like... Eddie sniffed, frowned. Something like a freshly blown fuse, but outside of that nothing seemed amiss at first. Then he discovered his softball and bat were missing. He found he didn't care too much. The season was over anyway, and besides, hunting and riding and fishing were more fun. He looked further. The cigarettes! He hoped the thief wouldn't snitch on him to Dad. But that didn't make too much sense, he realised. The thief, a tramp probably, was far away by now, maybe at this very minute trying to trade the ball and bat for a meal or a drink. And those humming lights... Even now he wasn't too sure he'd seen them. Stars, probably. The Little Dipper, or maybe fireflies, or lightning, sure. He turned to go. The sun told him it was almost seven o'clock. Mother would be furious if he found him out in the morning without having dressed properly or eaten. It was then he saw that something else was missing. But because it was so late, he didn't stop to worry. Mandrake, the magician... The Invisible Boys, Buck Rogers, Batman. They were all old comic books. He'd finished with them months ago. Eddie clambered down the rope, and seconds later he and Rags were joyfully racing along the trail that led to home. It was a beautiful morning. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of future's past. Science fiction and fantasy and horror, oh my!